would you educate your five boys? Actually, I created a little school. <laughs> yeah. What kind of school? Could you describe to us? Sure. It's, I mean, it's small. It's only got 14 kids now, and it'll have 20 kids in, in September. That's maybe a bit different from, from, from most other schools, is that there aren't any grades. There's no, there's no like, not grade one, grade two, grade three type of thing. And making all the children go in, in the same grade at the same time, like an assembly line. I know. Um, you know, because some people love English or languages. Some people love math. Some people love music. Mm. And, uh, and they have different abilities at different times. It makes more sense to, to cater the education to match their aptitudes and abilities. Mm -hmm. so I think that's one principle. Um, another is that it's important to teach, uh, teach problem solving or teach to the problem, not to the tools. Mm -hmm. Let's say um, you're trying to teach people about uh, how engines work or, mm -hmm. you know, you could start by a, tr more, a more traditional approach would be to say, well, we're going to teach you all about screwdrivers and wrenches, and, and you're going to have a course on screwdrivers, a course on wrenches, and all these things. And it's, mm. this is a very difficult way to, to do it. A mm. much better way would be like, here's the engine. Now mm. let's take it apart. How are we going to take it apart? Oh, you mm. need a screwdriver. That's what the screwdriver is for. You need a wrench. That's what the wrench is for. Mm -hmm. um, and then a very important thing happens, which is that the relevance of the tools becomes apparent. So all your five boys are in that school? Yes. Until when? This is from preschool to... So far to it's only one-year-old. <laughs> uh, uh, they like it. And you want to keep them away from regular schools? No, I just didn't see that uh, the re regular schools, just they weren't doing the things that I thought should be done. Like, you know, those two principles, they weren't uh, adhering to those principles. So I thought, well, let's see what we can do. Maybe creating a school will be better. I mean, the kids really love going to school. I think that's a... A good sign, you know. I mean, I hated going to school when I was a kid. It was torture. <laughs> the fact that they, uh, like, they actually think vacations are too long. Mm. Like, they want to go back to school. Wow. Yeah, exactly. That's weird. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get straight A's in school? If so, good for you. Congratulations. But in the real world, you'll never get straight A's again. There are ups and there are downs. And what I want to say to you today is that it's okay. I didn't attend to sure for that matter any college or my senior year of high school or most of the junior year. <laughs> this is where I started my first um, business when I was 10, 10 years old. You were 10? Yeah, so delivering the papers in the East End. <laughs> and then when I was 11, I had 17 teenagers working for me. Um, so you had a bunch of people working for you at 11? I did, yeah. First stop would be Michelle's secondary school, a place she left without any qualifications at the age of 15. This was where she was told that a future working down the local supermarket was the best she could expect. I don't really have nice memories, to be honest with you. I, I, I really struggled at school, academically. Uh, I was awful. Um, and I think always been told, you know, you're a failure and you'll never do well. And I suppose everyone around me kept saying, Michelle, you can't do this and you can't do that. And I used to say, why? Why do you say you can't? Surely you can. Surely we can find a way. And I used to challenge everyone. And what about your teachers? Did they have a, a little inkling that Michelle Moan was going to become a successful entrepreneur? I don't think so. I remember when I was 15, I had to go and see my careers teacher. I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. And she said, what does that mean? I, I think it's this notion that we really can't understand, but the government is always right. We really can't understand, but our teachers are always right. We really can't understand, but our clergymen are always right. Use them as, as your sole beacons in life, and don't try to figure these things out on your own, because you're really, you really can't, you're not smart enough, and just find the appropriate experts and follow their light. I think we're born slaves to reason. And it's really reason that's beaten out of us uh, through a, 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 pro, you know, a process of trying to please our teachers. We, I, I think we have two fundamental drives in our life. We want to, we want to be loved and we want to please people. And we, and we know how to think, we know how to reason. And these are often quite at odds because we're asked to believe a certain things, you know, believe certain, you know, certain things are correct. We're often just conforming to some fashion figuring out what the group wants from us and then conforming to that because we want to be accepted and loved. There's this other fundamental drive inside of us that, that, that where there's often tension between the two and that is the ability to think, the ability to reason, the ability to come to conclusions as to what works and what doesn't, what's fair and what's not fair, what's right and what's wrong. 
And when fashion and the pursuit of love gets, you know, uh, is in conflict with reason, too often fashion and the pursuit of love wins. In my case, it didn't. I think academic success is an advantage. But it by no means assures success in business. I think if you're an outstanding student, you're probably going to be reasonably successful in business. You might not be amongst the most successful people in, in, in business or even in science. The straight A students uh, sometimes are, well, well there, there's no doubt that they have talent. Maybe it would have be better if they gotten straight A's in math and physics, but flunked a, a sociology course where the professor was just awful or got a C in a sociology course where that there wasn't a need to always please, always do well, even if it didn't make sense to do well and put in the effort. At least what we look for when we're hiring, hiring people are people that certainly have a strong aptitude uh, in mathematics and in physics and in music, which is very highly correlated to mathematics, uh, but also people who make judgments as to where they're gonna invest their time Wonderful story about a young man who was near the top of his class at Carnegie Mellon and quit the, the, the week before he, uh, the work, the week before he was going to graduate. It was that interesting judgment that that he made uh, that he was just going to bail, uh, bail out, uh, that set him apart. Strangely enough, for, you know, from a lot of the other very top grads, grads that we have hired, he makes his own decisions, and that's a very useful thing. Uh, and I think we, you know, corporations need a combination of uh, people who, every, hopefully all the people have, are, you know, are, are talented. Uh, some are people that really want to please and are easy to manage. Others really are kind of driven you know, to, their, you know, to, to a drummer only they can hear. They will constantly question my wisdom <laughs> and be, won't be the least bit shy about challenging me and hopefully make me, keep me from making mistakes. Probably the single most important aspect of my personality and is, as far as determining my success has been my, uh, my questioning of conventional wisdom, my doubting of experts just because they're experts, and questioning of authority. And while that can be very, very painful in terms of your relationship with your parents and your relationship with your teachers, it's enormously useful in life. Uh, I had some teachers when I was very, very young that I, that I thought were telling me things that weren't true. And when I tried to ask questions, they basically wanted me to respond, basically you know, parrot back what they said. They really weren't interested in a discourse with a child or a debate with a child. They said, this was true, and you are smart if you can repeat it back to me exactly what I said to you. And I had a real problem with that as well. And, and, I, and I had a mixture of teachers. Some, some of the teachers were wonderful, and some of the teachers were awful. But the awful, teach, the awful teachers served a good purpose in terms of being a bad, you know, bad example, all examples are good. Bad examples are useful. Good examples are useful. And uh, it taught me to question experts. Were you academic at school? Oh, not at all. No, I didn't have a clue. I, I struggled to write the date on the top of the top. And, uh, you know, I, the answer's no, completely no. I, I, didn't, I didn't really enjoy school. You didn't? No, I, I, because it's awkward for me. I, you know, I was forever in trouble simply because I, I didn't have an ability to learn anything. And I, it, it just went over my head, practically everything I'd done. Those days... So you were, are dyslexic then? For sure, yeah. Uh, and the, in those days they would call it uh, backward, but it was no big offensive thing then, was it? So you learned from your perspective, you didn't learn anything from school at all? No, I, I'm going to say, you know, I'm not ashamed of it, but when I left school I, I couldn't, well I can't write now. Um, you can't I, write at all? No, no, not at all. Uh, I can't write, I can't spell. Um, can you read? Yeah, I, I could read when I was about 27, and I can read anything now. Um, I can. My mouth is pretty hot. You know, that, that's pretty. So you're quick. good with numbers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm really good with numbers. But the fact that a multi-millionaire owner of a massive retail empire left school with no qualifications and without being able to read or write was not a massive surprise to me, because I'm partially dyslexic. The customers of education are the society at large employers that hire people, right, mm -hmm. things like that. But ultimately, I think the customers are the parents, not even the students, but the parents. And the problem that we have in this country is that the customers went away. The customers stopped paying attention to their schools for the most part. Well, what happened was is that mothers started working, and they didn't have time to spend at PTA meetings and watching their kids' school. Um, schools became much more institutionalized. What happens when a customer goes away and a monopoly 
gets control, which is what's happened in our country, is that the service level almost always goes down. I remember seeing a bumper sticker when the telephone company was all one, AT&T, the Bell system. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing a, a, a bumper sticker with the, the Bell logo on it, and it said, we don't care, <laughs> we don't have to. You know? <laughs> and that's what a monopoly is. Sure. That's what IBM was in their day, and that's certainly what this, the public school system is. They don't have to care. The most expensive thing most people buy in their lives is a house. The second most expensive thing is a car, usually. Average car is approximately about $20,000 now, $16,000, $20,000. And an average car lasts about, what, eight years? Right? You buy another one? Yeah. Approximately um, you know, $2,000 a year. Your child goes to school, right, uh, approximately eight years in K through eight, right? <laughs> right? You don't like to switch schools. It's about an eight-year commitment. What does the state of California spend per pupil per year? It's about forty-four hundred dollars. Wow. Okay, about twice as over twice as much as a car. It turns out that when you go to buy a car, you have a lot of information available to you to make a choice, and you have a lot of choices. Oh, yeah. I mean, General Motors and Ford and Toyota and Chrysler and Nissan—they are advertising at me like crazy. I can't get through a day without seeing five car ads. And they seem to be able to make these cars efficiently enough that they can afford to take some of my money and advertise to other people with it. Sure. So that everybody knows all about these cars. And they keep getting better and better and better each year because there's a lot of competition. And there's a warranty. And there's a warranty, <laughs> that's right. But in schools, since people don't feel like they're spending their own money, they feel like it's free, oh, yeah. right? No one does any comparison shopping. Matter of fact, if you want to put your kid in a private school, you can't take the $4,400 a year out of the public school and use it. That if the, the country gave each parent a voucher, a check for $4,400 that they could only spend at any accredited school, and schools would start marketing themselves like crazy to parents to get students. Secondly, I think you see a lot of new schools starting. I've suggested as an example, if you go to Stanford Business School, they have a public policy track. They could start a school administrator track. So you could get a bunch of people coming out of college, tying up with somebody who just got out of business school. They could be starting their own schools. Sure. You could have 25-year-old kids out of college, very idealistic, full of energy. Instead of starting a Silicon Valley company, they'd start a school. And I believe they would do far better than many of our public school teachers do. The third thing you'd see is I believe that you would see the quality of schools, again, just like in a competitive market, start to rise. Some schools would go broke. A lot of the public schools would go broke. There's no question about it. It would be rather painful for the first several years. And, and, but I think far less painful than the kids going through the system as it is right now. Well, the biggest complaint is, of course, that schools would pick off all the good kids and all the bad kids would be left to wallow together in either a, you know, a, a, a private school or the rem remnants of the public school. To me, that's like saying, well, all the car manufacturers are going to make BMWs and Mercedes and nobody's going to make a $10,000 car. Well, I think the most hotly competitive market right now is the $10,000 so car. You're a uh, doctor because you have a PhD of electrical engineering. Is that true? That's correct, yes. And isn't it also true you've never had a job? Never had a job. Well, please tell them why. Well, it's very simple. I went through engineering school. I spent eight years at university getting a PhD. And at the end of that time, I was offered a job at $32,000 a year, which in those days was a pretty handsome salary. However, unbeknown to my prospective employer, the week before, I had just done a real estate deal that netted me $35,000. And I remember thinking to myself, why would anyone in their right mind work for 40 hours a week for 50 weeks of the year for $32,000 when in one week you can make $35,000? And I decided there and then to get into real estate, and I've never had a job. Weren't you just terrible at school? <laughs> I was, I was, I was um, uh, dyslexic. Um, I, I had no understanding of schoolwork whatsoever. I certainly would have, would have failed IQ tests. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's one of the reasons I left school, at school when I was 15 years old. You know, if I'm not interested in something, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I just don't, I don't grasp it. Uh, I just love learning. And I'm incredibly inquisitive, and um, I love taking on the, you know, the, the status quo and trying to turn it upside down. So 
Um, so I've seen life as one long, one long learning process. Some bizarre things happened just earlier in your life. I mean, there's the story about your, your mother allegedly dumping you in a field and uh, aged four and saying, OK, walk home. And uh, what? She felt that we needed to stand on our own two feet from an early age. So she did, th she did things to us which now she'd be arrested for. Uh, so, yeah, such as you know, telling, pushing us out of the car and telling us to find our own way to Granny's uh, um, about five miles before we actually got there. Um, and um, and making, us, making us go on you know, wonderful long bike rides and never, we're never allowed to watch television. And I think that if you expect a lot of efficiency, financial efficiency in American higher education, you're howling at the wind. Monopoly has kind of, and bureaucracy have kind of pernicious effects everywhere, and the universities aren't exempted from it. We have entitlements for the young. We spend $600 billion a year educating 50 million kids in the public schools between kindergarten and 12th grade. And just think of what that is as an entitlement. Never, nobody ever seems to bring that up. If we have problems with our school system, it's not because we're cheap. You know, it, it, there are other problems that contribute to it. In terms, of, in terms of the money we put out, we're right up there. I was the trustee of a college that saw the endowment go from $8 million to over a billion. I didn't see the tuition come down, and I didn't see the number of students go up. Nothing went up uh, except the professor's salaries. Yeah, from eight million to a billion. I mean, and, and, and very, very decent people running the place. But when you read the figures on endowment of the big schools, uh, you know, and some of them have really gotten up into big numbers, the main objective of the people running the endowment is to have the endowment grow larger. And uh, that will be ever thus. That is the way humans operate. Do you have any more comments on that, Charlie? You've seen a lot. I have made all the enemies I can afford at the moment. Okay. It's fun by the elite academic types in America to say McDonald's is the wrong kind of food and it's the wrong kind of this and the jobs don't pay very much and so forth. I have a quite a different view. I think McDonald's is one of the most successful educational institutions in the United States. They take people and give them a first job, which enables them to get a second job. They do a very, very good job of educating troubled young people to be good, good citizens. And they're probably more successful than charter schools. So I, so I am a big fan of McDonald's. Those people are running very good habits. They've got to be there at a certain time. They have to, they have to learn how to count money and price items. And, and they have to learn how to smile at people and, 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 and have happy customers. Charlie went to the public school system in Omaha, as did I. Do you think that it's as important for the American family to put their child through college and higher learning at this time? It depends on the, on the person, but generally speaking, investing in yourself is the best thing you can do. Anything that improves your own talents. Like nobody can take it away from you. They can run up huge deficits and the dollar can be, become worth far less. You can have all kinds of things happen. But if you've got talent yourself uh, and you've maximized your talent, uh, you've got a terrific asset. And so that doesn't mean everybody should go to college, but it, it does mean that any way you find to improve. Communication skills are enormously important. I mean, I took a Dale Carnegie course that I paid $100 for, and it was worth a college degree. Uh, at least I thought it was. <laughs> you went to Alice Deal Junior High School, got a lot of uh, C's and D's, as I understand. <laughs> and then you went to Woodrow Wilson High School, uh, finished uh, 16th in your class. Uh, but you were class of seventeen, we might add. Right. <laughs> well, you had you were working. You were doing. You were pa delivering papers in the morning and delivering yeah. papers in the evening and so forth. You filed your first tax return when you were fourteen years old. Yeah, it was for the it was for the year when I was thirteen, and 13. I filed it when I was fourteen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> After you graduated from Woodrow Wilson, you then went to uh, actually the University of Pennsylvania Correct. for a year and a half. And then you transferred back to the University of Nebraska. Why did you leave Penn? That was a great business school. Why did you leave? Yeah, I just, I, I felt I would, I mean, I wanted to quit after one year to be, um, to give okay. you the honest answer on it. My father talked me, he kind of talked me into going to college in the first place. And then he talked me into going a second year. But he said if I went a second year, then I could, I could drop out. And uh, so then I went back to Nebraska. That way I got out of college in three years. And so it, it sped okay. things up. And I planned to live in Nebraska. 
So when you graduated from the University of Nebraska, you applied to Harvard Business School and were rejected. That's true. Um, has yeah. Harvard ever announced that they've regretted that decision? Well, the, the, <laughs> I, I understand the development officer is kind of right. unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> I was earning a living, I was on my way, so I thought, I'm gonna let this college thing go, and I only had one credit. But my father, from that time on, and for years after, was always on my case, because I did not graduate. He'd say, Obergeil, that's my middle name, I don't know what you're gonna do without that degree. And I'd say, but Dad, I have my own television show. And he'd say, well, I still don't know what you're gonna do without that degree. And I'd say, but Dad, now I'm a talk show host. He'd say, I don't know how you're going to get another job without that degree. <laughs> so in 1987, Tennessee State University invited me back uh, to speak at their commencement. By then, I had my own show, was nationally syndicated, I'd made a movie, had been nominated for an Oscar, and founded my company, Harpo. Your education, of course, isn't ending here. In many ways, it's only just begun. The world has so many lessons to teach you. I consider the world, this earth, to be like a school. You tried to get into three colleges. Mm -hmm. Each time they rejected you. There is an examination that young people, if you want to go to university, you have to taste, take the examinations. So I failed three times. Right. But a lot of fail. I failed for funny things that I failed a key primary school test for two times. And I failed uh, um, like uh, two, three times for the middle school, middle schools. And uh, you, you will never believe in, in Hangzhou, my city, there's only one middle school that lasts only one year. It was changed from primary school to middle school because our graduates of our, our, our school, no, univers you, no middle school accept us because we were too bad. Yeah. <laughs> They would become a middle school. <laughs> for three years, I tried to fill in the universities. So I applied jobs for 30 times, got rejected. I went for a police. They said, no, you're not good. I went to even the uh, KFC. When KFC came to China, come to my city, <laughs> you 20, 24 people went for the job. Yeah. 23 people were accepted. I was the only one guy. <laughs> And we went for police. Five people, four of them accepted. I was the only guy that I rece received it. So to me, being turned down, rejected. Oh, by the way, I told you that I, would, I applied for Harvard yeah. for 10 times rejected. Yeah. I know I'll be rejected. Yeah, I just want to say that. Yeah, sorry now. <laughs> 10 times you wrote them and said, I'd like to come to Harvard. Yeah. And then I told myself, somebody I should go teach there, baby. <laughs> I, I think that can be arranged. Um. There is no way to learn English at that time. There is no teachers in our city who can teach people to speak English. So I listened to the BBC and Voice of America. The foreign visitors. So every morning for nine years, I showed them around as a free guide. And they taught me English. And I think that changed me. Today, I'm 100% made in China. I've never got a one-day train outside China. Yeah. And uh, people, when people talk to me, say, Jack, how can you speak English like that? Why sometimes you, you talk like an Amer Western guys? I think that was the nine years. These Western for tourists opened my mind. Everything I learned from the, the, the tourists, foreign tourists, are so different from the things I learned from the, my, from the schools, my parents, because we thought China was like that, the world was like that, in our books, you know. But the thing that I learned from outside, that's so different. So that trained my way of thinking different. When people talk about everything, when everything people agree, normally I take one minute to think about, is that true? When everything disagree, I say, take about one minute, think about it, hmm, is that true? I went from being a failed blues musician, living in a crummy bedsit, without the price of a pint of beer in my pocket, let alone the money to pay my landlady the rents. I went from being a high school dropout without a penny of capital or the benefit of a university education to owning my own business into becoming one of the richest men in Britain. This target that we have of getting 
approximately 50% of all the young people in Britain into a college and higher education of some kind is absolutely ludicrous. That's why you haven't got any plumbers, that's why you've got no electricians. The reason we do this, of course, is just so that we can reduce the number of people that are unemployed. And the governments of various ilk have been doing that for years. So the facts of the matter are that we ought to face up to the realities of the situation. We should choose a target of about 15 or 20 percent of people that actually go to university. The rest should go through apprenticeship schemes and polytechnics and the old fashioned word. We've just got too many people, too many parents who are desperate for their young children to go to university. And I'm sorry, it's nuts. When he was 13 years old, he told you one day we're going to start a company, run a company. He was saying, well, imagine what it's like to run a Fortune 500 company. And I'm thinking, I, I have no idea. One of Alan's ideas Gates didn't shoot down would lead to the personal computer revolution and launch Microsoft. It was 1974. He was a college dropout working in Boston. Computers, when I was young, were super expensive. And my friend Paul Allen and I actually snuck into places at the University of Washington where they had computers that weren't being used at night. Very few people were getting exposure. We had to go out of our way, and we were lucky that we did it all. You went to Harvard, and you dropped out. Have you ever thought how your life could be better off if you had gotten your Harvard degree? I feel it was unfortunate uh, that I didn't get to stay there, but I don't think I missed any knowledge because, you know, whatever I needed to learn, I, would, I was still in a, a learning mode. You know, I didn't view it as risky. I viewed it as this kind of fun hobby. Even when I went to college, which I didn't finish, but I, I spent time uh, up in Cambridge, <laughs> Massachusetts, uh, my passion, my hobby, and the area I could start this company right at the beginning of the, the revolution, that coincided in a nice way. And I never felt it was risky. I, I you know, if Microsoft had failed, I could go back to school and, uh, you know, finish my degree. I've been waiting more than 30 years to say this. <laughs> Dad, I always told you I'd come back and get my degree. <laughs> I want to thank Harvard for this honor. I'll be changing my job next year, and it will be nice to finally have a college degree on my resume. <laughs> I'm just happy that the Crimson called me Harvard's most successful dropout. I guess that makes me valedictorian of my own special class. I did the best of everyone who failed. But I also want to be recognized as the guy who got Steve Ballmer to drop out of business school. <laughs> I'm a bad influence. That's why I was invited to speak at your graduation. If I'd spoken at your orientation, fewer of you might be here today. Harvard was a phenomenal experience for me. Academic life was fascinating. I used to sit in on lots of classes that I hadn't even signed up for. And dorm life was terrific. There were always a lot of people in my dorm room late at night discussing things because everyone knew that I didn't worry about getting up in the morning. <laughs> One of my biggest memories of Harvard came in January 1975 when I made a call from Courier House to a company in Albuquerque, New Mexico that had begun making the world's first personal computer, I offered to sell them software. I worried they would realize I was just a student in a dorm and hang up on me. Instead, they said, we're not quite ready. Come see us in a month, which was a good thing because we hadn't written the software yet. <laughs> from that moment, I worked day and night on the extra credit project that marked the end of my college education and the beginning of a remarkable journey with Microsoft. I was always, um, you know, taken apart, 
telephones, radios, televisions, sort of anything electronic I could get my hands on. I'd like to kind of see how it worked, and I was mostly interested in, in understanding how, how things worked. Good thing about the early personal computers is that they had completely kind of standardized chips. And so you could literally get a book about each chip and read what each you know, pin did and how signals were processed through the chip. And you could design your own circuits and you could modify them. That was sort of the, the classroom for me. <laughs> that, was, that was where I learned you know, the, the, the basics of how, how these things work. My mother was, uh, you know, a, a financial consultant, so she was sort of, you know, immersed in, in the, the world of stocks and bonds, and, you know, I kind of became interested in, uh, you know, currencies and interest rates and, you know, uh, what was going on with commodity prices and kind of an odd thing for a 13-year-old to be doing, but, but I kind of found it interesting and, and um you know, uh, would sort of read reports and, you know, started playing around and in, in investing in things and found, just found that, uh, that whole idea fascinating. When I was 16, I, I got this job working for a newspaper in Houston. And my job was to sell subscriptions to the paper on the telephone. And um, I realized uh, people that uh, were buying the newspaper generally had two things in common. Either they were moving to a new residence or they were getting married. And uh, it turns out that you could go find information about both of those things in enormous quantities. So I hired all my friends and went to every county in the surrounding 16 counties in Houston, captured the addresses of all the people that applied for marriage licenses, and sent them a direct mail offer. You know, ended up making a, making a fair sum of money for a, for a teenager. Beatrix developed an intense passion for art. Her family engaged a drawing mistress. Is, I hope it is not pride that makes me so stiff against teaching, but it cannot be taught. She was fascinating to children. She used to write us letters. So I shall tell you a story about four little rabbits whose names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. One day... She really knew her subjects. She'd kept, reared, sketched, even dissected the animals whose characters she so acutely depicted. Since nobody would publish her books, she did so herself. The first, The Tale of Peter Rabbit, was printed privately and cost her 14 pounds. Only then did the children's book publishers, Warns, agree to bring it out themselves. Lee Kaixing is, by any measure, one of the giants of the business world. A refugee in wartime Hong Kong, he went on to establish an empire that controls ports at both ends of the Panama Canal, produces oil in the United States, and operates telecommunications in the UK. Hailed as one of the greatest entrepreneurs in history. You, know, you grew up quite poor. You had to quit school when you were very young. How did you educate yourself and how did you learn business? Yogi 老師教的高中生的課程
係你細路個十四五歲識得做咩，但係呢，都係盡量使到個工作做得好。人家喺度反嘅時間，你求好嘛？自己呢，大家都係受咁少嘅教育嘅同事，你你日日睇到佢呢，保持現現狀。而自己呢，日日個學問好咗，一樣咁嘅人做事打工好，我一路呢係想。I've never said that there's a one size fits all approach. Education has become a substitute for thinking about the future. You know,、um, and the K through 12 system is geared towards college,、um, and the problem is life doesn't end in college. You know, it. it You know, hopefully, you live for you know a long time after that, and do many、uh, many things after college. And there's a strange way where you know, we live in a society where there's a lot of anxiety about the future,、um, and we've put more and more money into education for the last 35 years as a way of dealing with this anxiety. Where if you get into the right college, you know you'll be saved. If you don't, you're in trouble. And I've sort of described、uh, the college,、uh, the sort of dramatic version I've said is you know colleges they're like. They're as corrupt as the Catholic Church was 500 years ago.、Mm. Uh, they're sort、wow. of charging people more and more. It's the system of indulgences. You have this priestly or professorial class that doesn't do very much work, and then、um, and then you basically tell people that、uh, if you get a diploma, you're saved. You know, otherwise you go to hell. You know, you go to Yale or you go to jail. That's sort <laughs> of the that's sort of um, and um, and what I think we need to we need to push back um on this um on this. That this this idea that the only way you get saved is you know Catholic Church 500 years ago or today the only way to get saved is by、uh, by getting a diploma from college and I hope I hope that in the future there will be、um, many different kinds of、uh, productive things for people to do. If you define technology as doing more with、uh, less,、um, education is perhaps the most anti-technological aspect of our society today, where、uh, you're getting the same at a Higher and higher price.、Right. Uh, you know the, the the real costs of higher education since 1980 have gone up about 400 percent. It's after inflation. It's not clear the quality has gone up at all. The universities have found that they can just charge more every year. You know the question is maybe why has there not been more resistance to these、right. these price hikes? And I think it again in part goes to this failure of an imagination of an alternate future. And so. Uh, talented people should all go to the same universities, learn the same things, uh, uh, pursue the same、uh, types of careers. If we had an internet bubble or a housing bubble, we certainly have an education、uh, bubble today, and it has.、Uh, it is、um, you know bubbles are characterized by、um, things costing more than they're worth. They're characterized by sort of intense psychosocial dynamics. So it's、um, it's very hard for people to suggest that you should. Not go to a, the best college you can get into、right. because people don't know what else to do. So again, this sort of failure of imagination of an alternate future. Bubbles are also characterized by abstractions away from reality, and、uh, and so I think the word education itself、um, is this incredible abstract filler. What is it specifically that you're learning? Is education an investment decision, where it's basically、uh, something you invest to get a better-paying job? Is it a consumption decision where it's sort of a four-year party,、um, and uh, maybe uh, maybe it's sort of a combination of a bad investment and bad consumption decision, where basically、uh, people think they are investing by consuming, which was characteristic of the housing bubble, where you bought an especially large house with a swimming pool and you patted yourself on the back for being an incredibly frugal investor,、right. and、uh, and so there's sort of an aspect of that. But I've come to think that、uh, even more than investment or consumption. Um, it's perhaps better to think of、um, education as、uh, understood as an insurance policy, where it's、uh, it's probably not worth as much as people are paying for it, but they're scared of falling through the cracks in our society, and so as the cracks get bigger, we pay more and more for、uh, for insurance against it. That's the way it's advertised, and then I think the reality is that it's the exact opposite of an insurance policy. It is actually sort of this this crazy zero sum tournament in which.、Um, In which what really matters is getting into the best schools, and then、um, a diploma from a third-tier university、um, is really a dunce hat in disguise. At its core, it's perhaps a, a,、um, a zero-sum tournament、um, masquerading as as,、uh, as general insurance, and that's that's incredibly dissonant. Historically, I think the tone has been set by the. 
the top universities. They have uh, these enormously uh, rich endowments, and uh, they are incredibly resistant to uh, to influence from the outside. And uh, and so I do think, I do think it's the kind of thing that's very hard to reform uh, from uh, from without. It is nevertheless, I think, heading towards a crisis of sorts, where uh, it simply no longer works for. Um, the vast majority of uh, middle class students who are amassing enormous amounts of debt uh, going to college and so there is going to be uh, enormous pressure and you know there is sort of a subtle point where something goes from a not great system into an all out racket where uh, does it how much sense does it make for professors to really invest in their graduate students and PhD programs when there's a sense that none of these people will get jobs anymore anyway right. and so I, I think you are sort of in this in this zone of where uh, it has, in many ways, become this uh, this incredible racket, and it's 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 it it is hard to really know what people inside it think. There is sort of an egalitarian assumption embl embedded in education, where uh, where it's assumed um, that everyone is more or less the same, yes, and therefore, um, if you look at how well do people do who graduate from Harvard versus people who just have a high school diploma, and let's say they make twice as much money per year if they graduate from Harvard as with a high school diploma. Um, it's assumed that this is prima facie evidence of how um, great the Harvard education is. Reality is much more that it's a super selective uh, selection of factors. So there's selection, there's signaling, um, relatively little uh, sort of value added learning. But uh, because we have this egalitarian mindset, it's, it's sort of hard to make the argument that it is just um, this uh, the selection rather than a value-added learning. The obvious way to illustrate this would be if you said that the top universities in the U.S. were doing as good a job as they claim, the most natural thing for them to do would be to increase enrollment. So if you say you have 1,600 people a year going to Harvard and we're, do we're offering them a fantastic education that's making them much better than they otherwise would have been, you know, I mean, could, you, could you sort of have some structured growth plan where you increase that number to maybe 3,000 over 20 years? Uh, certainly the population of the country is a lot larger. Right. It's, uh, it's attracting people from all over the world. So if you're offering such a great education, what sort of a product is it that um, where you wouldn't increase the number of people who use it? I mean, I think the only, the only product I can think of where you would limit access as much would be a nightclub, <laughs> which, is, which, is a, which is sort of, uh, again, a zero-sum product right. that's based on exclusion. And I think that if you went to any of these top universities and you proposed doubling the enrollment, um, you would get a uniform opposition from the alumni, from the current students, from the faculty, because it would, they would rightly right. perceive they would make it less prestigious, even though that, that sort of goes very much against this egalitarian ethos that everyone's the same. One of the things that uh, makes the education bubble different from, say, the housing or the, or the tech bubble of, of the last decades is that it is actually very hard to measure what the quality of of education is. And so when people say things like, you'll figure it out in 20 years, there are things you will learn that are intangible that will help you 20 years in the future, you know, somewhat cynical cut on that might be that, uh, well, this is the sort of thing you say if you're running a scam where you want to have a really long right. shelf life to it so people won't notice that they've been defrauded for a long time. But uh, there is something about the um, immeasurability of education that's made the uh, education bubble um, quite durable. But on the other hand, that it probably also means that it's gotten bigger and bigger in a way that's um, that's extremely distorted. If I if I look at what uh, people thought my my senior year in high school, sort of like were very ambitious, they had all these ideas what they were going to do, and if you looked at the same people at uh, sort of college plus five years, sort of nine years later, let's say, uh, it was amazing how much things have been ratcheted down. And so I I do think there's something problematic where all the talented people go to these schools they're sort of evaluated on the same terms and at the end uh, at the end a lot of ambitions are, are beaten out of them you know, probably the, the the one that I think is um, even worse for people than Harvard in this respect uh, might be a might be Caltech where you have you know these brilliant math physics people and after four years where you're in the middle of your class you're convinced that the most you can do with your life is become a line engineer at Lockheed and maybe you can go into mid-level management uh, 20 years later. And so that, that is, that sort of is characteristic of, uh, of, uh, of what I think has happened. And what, what, what I think we need to somehow 
find a way back to is is this idea that um, that there's not just a single track that there are very different things uh, you can do you know the question you know what truth do you know that nobody agrees with you on the the, the sort of career version of this is um, what what are you really good at <coughs> that other people aren't that good at right. or or something like that and that's uh, and that somehow gets discouraged by this by this incredible homogenization. Vital Tebow is at ease in a workshop. It comes from a lifetime of making, inventing, and fixing, much of it self-taught. His formal schooling ended at a neglected rural Acadie schoolhouse in grade four. We didn't have no teacher half the time. At 14, he was working in the woods but he'd inherited a knack for mechanics from his father, Pascal, and Vital quickly made himself indispensable to employers. He got around his lack of literacy by asking lots and lots of questions. There's no such a thing as can't, as far as I'm concerned. And that's the way I work. And uh, I don't think you'll for an answer and, and keep on trucking. That attitude brought success. He was a valued employee and respected outside of work becoming head of the New Brunswick Trapping Association, even inventing and patenting the vital humane animal trap. Needing a hobby on retiring, he opened a fish hatchery. In no time, he was making a million dollars a year, all without being able to read or write. Inspired by an interview on Oprah, Vital had a new goal, to write a book about his life. He just had to figure out how to tell it. That began six years of struggle, trying first to work a computer then to make a voice translation program understand his accent. Start with the project we had started the year before. The result, a book published just in time for his 85th birthday this week. To me, it's the big, the biggest adventure record. The title of his book, A Message for You. All throughout my childhood, I built games that I wanted to play, uh, I built a music player that I wanted. I, I, I tried to build stuff that, that I really wanted for, for myself. And then when I got to college, I, I started wanting to build products that uh, would let me get insight into the community around me and let me connect with the people around me. Then when I went on to build later stuff, I, I had those lessons and I knew that I could set those things up quickly, so those were just building blocks on top of which to build future things. I built the first version of Facebook during reading period, which is basically this two or three week period that Harvard, I don't know if they still give this, but basically. They don't. Yeah, I think they stopped. But, Shocking. Well, you know. Both Microsoft and Facebook started during reading period. Yeah, so no Harvard likes canceling things that work. Yeah. So, um, the, <laughs> um, so basically, it's this period during January before your finals where you can ostensibly study for classes for, for your finals. And, and I took that period to write the first version of Facebook. But then one day, I woke up a couple of days before this um, final for this class that I was taking called the Rome of Augustus. It was this um, lit and arts class. And the class was all about learning the historical significance of a bunch of pieces of art that were there. And for the final, they were just gonna show some pieces of art from the class, and uh, you had to write an essay on the significance of them. And I, I hadn't really gone to class all term, I just like programmed. And then during reading period, when I should have been learning this, I programmed. So I was pretty screwed, right? I mean, there was no way that I was going to cover all this material. So I just went to the course website, downloaded all the, the images, and uh, made a little website that basically would randomly show one of the images and would let you contribute your notes of what you thought was reasonable, uh, what was important about that photo that, yes. that other people <laughs> learned through hard work. <laughs> and, um, and then I sent this out to the course email list. I was like, hey guys, I built a study tool. And within an hour, the whole thing was just populated with all the information that we needed to take the class, uh, to take the final. So I, I think I did pretty well in the final. Right, I mean, you have to remember, I was 19 years old when I started Facebook. I knew nothing, nothing about business at all. How you did know, you learn? How did you learn well, just to from, from manage a lot of the people? people around me. But there's so many mistakes that just come from not... I mean, like, I really knew so little at the time. I never read a lot of the literature on this, and I mean, maybe if I had, then I wouldn't have made so many mistakes. <laughs> By his own account, he was curious to the point of mischief. He once spent hours sitting on a neighbor's goose eggs in an effort to hatch them, and set fire to a barn just to see what it would do. He exasperated his teacher. The boy is backward, the teacher complained. All he does is ask questions. 
Nonsense, said the boy's mother. I'll teach you myself. Given just three months of formal schooling, he spent the carefree afternoons of boyhood reading his way through the library and obsessively conducting chemistry experiments in the cellar. So to finance his dabbling, he went to work at the age of 12, taking a job as a newsboy on the train. He taught himself Morse code and practiced sending and receiving telegraph messages for up to 18 hours a day before finally landing his first job as an operator when he was just 15. By then, he'd become aware that he was losing his hearing. But with telegraphy, he found that deafness gave him an edge. And tinkered with the instruments to improve them. In 1869, Edison came to New York City penniless looking for a job. It was a time of hardship. Then he invented a stock ticker, the forerunner of the ticker machines used in modern stock exchanges. The invention netted Edison $40,000. I never really expected to find myself giving advice to people graduating from an establishment of higher education. I never graduated from any such establishment. I never even started at one. I escaped from school as soon as I could when the prospect of four more years of enforced learning before I could become the writer I wanted to be seemed stifling. I got out into the world, I wrote, and I became a better writer the more I wrote, and I wrote some more, and nobody ever seemed to mind that I was making it all up as I went along. They just read what I wrote, and they paid me for it, or they didn't. <laughs> as a career implies that I had some kind of career plan, and I never did. The nearest thing I had was a list I made when I was about 15 of everything I wanted to do. I wanted to write an adult novel, a children's book, a comic, a movie, record an audio book, write an episode of Doctor Who, and so on. I didn't have a career, I just did the next thing on the list. I learned to write by writing. I tended to do anything as long as it felt like an adventure, and to stop when it felt like work, which meant that life did not feel like work. I watched my peers and my friends, and the ones who were older than me, and I'd watch how miserable some of them were. I'd listen to them telling me they couldn't envisage a world where they did what they've always wanted to do anymore, because now they had to earn a certain amount every month just to keep where they were. They couldn't go and do the things that mattered and that they'd really wanted to do, and that seemed as big a tragedy as any problem of failure. So make up your own rules. Someone asked me recently how to do something she thought was going to be difficult. In this case, recording an audiobook. And I suggested she pretend that she was someone who could do it. I've been making a list of the things they don't teach you at school. They don't teach you how to love somebody. They don't teach you how to be famous. They don't teach you how to be rich or how to be poor. They don't teach you how to walk away from someone you don't love any longer. They don't teach you how to know what's going on in someone else's mind. They don't teach you what to say to someone who's dying. And they don't teach you anything worth knowing. Education or financial education is so important. And I think it's really silly that our school systems keep saying to you, go to school to get a safe, secure what? Job, when jobs are being exported overseas so fast right now, it's ridiculous. And I've never understood why our school systems don't teach us anything about money. You ever wonder that yourself? Why? Because rich or poor, smart or not so smart, we're all going to use money. And it's because our school systems don't teach us much about money, that's the reason so many people are having problems today financially. And I, so I'm not blaming Wall Street or people who are financial advisors. I'm blaming our education system. Because we don't have much financial education at school, we actually learn it from our families. The poor people tell their kids that the government's going to take care of you. What the middle class tells their kids is that they should have a good education, get a good high paying job, a house and a pension. What they are are passive investors. A passive investor is somebody who turns their money over to somebody they hope and pray is an expert. The poor are non-investors. So the difference between a passive investor and an active investor, and what the rich teach their kids, what my rich dad taught me, was that I should have, I should be an entrepreneur like Bill Gates or Oprah and I should be an active investor like Warren Buffett or Donald Trump and things like this. A passive investor is a person always going around saying, I have $25,000, I have $25,000, what should I do with it? 
And the first thing I say, if I were you, I would keep your mouth shut, you know? Because <laughs> if you go around telling people you have $25,000 and you're a moron, somebody will tell you what to do with that money, and they're going to tell you, give it to them. And one of the reasons my poor dad was poor, as a good man, he had the vocabulary of a school teacher. You know, he thought gerunds and prepositions were really important. But I've never made a dollar off a gerund or a preposition yet that I know of, you know? <laughs> I need the difference between EBITDA, uh, PEs, ROIs, IRR, that's what makes me rich. When you leave school, as my rich dad said, his banker has never ever asked to see his report card yet. You know, a banker never said, say Robert, uh, can you tell me what college you went to? Are you an A student? Are you a B student? They never asked that. I started studying education at a later time when I was about 38 years old. And I realized that each and every one of us was a genius, except in school. There are certain people, like I had a classmate who was considered a genius in school. This guy could do quantum physics and all that when he was in kindergarten. The trouble is he couldn't tie his shoelaces. How many people knew people like that? You know, they're absolute, and they are geniuses in school, but in the real world, they're incompetent. This guy didn't know his left hand from his right hand. You know, we used to play baseball, and I said, how can he be a genius? He doesn't know. He, he, could, he could never figure out with the glove went in his left hand or his right hand. But he was a genius. You know, I said, how can he be a genius? He can't pitch, can't bat, you know, it's like this. So I started to realize that genius, that every one of us had it. And what genius stands for is this here. God created every animal on earth, every species to have a special advantage. For instance, birds can fly, cheetahs run fast, and cockroaches, you can't kill them, you know? <laughs> So if animals have special advantages, so does each and every one of us. For example, Tiger Woods is a genius in the environment called the golf course. Tiger Woods would not be a genius as a jockey. And he's just too big. I would definitely not be a jockey, you know what I mean, like this? And you look at Mick Jagger. He went to school to be an accountant, but he became a billionaire as a rolling stone. The thing I want to leave you with tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is have the courage to find that environment, like Tiger Woods on the golf course, Mick Jagger as a Rolling Stone, Oprah in front of television. Find that spot where your genius comes out. That's what intelligence is. My genius was crushed in school. I was labeled stupid and dyslexic and no attention and jumping around all the time. I also, my genius did not come out in the corporate world. I do not like being told what to do and kissing you know what to get the co corporate ladder. I do not do that stuff well. I do well on the streets. Does that make sense to you guys here? That's where my genius came out. And the other thing is that I never, I flunked out of school twice because I could not write. And I do not read that well yet. But only, you know, no, it's true. I flunked when I was 15 and I flunked out when I was 17. And today, I have one of the top three books in the history of the New York Times. I've been on the New York Times bestseller list for over five years now. Only two books have beat me. One of them is The Joy of Sex. That might take a while to beat. <laughs> <laughs> so when I flunked out of school, you know, and now I have a New York Times bestseller for five years, I'm still a lousy writer. People say, you can't write. I say, you sound like my English teacher, you know. And after I flunked out of school and then this book became, I was scarred for the longest time. I really thought I was stupid. It pained me. Here's my father, the superintendent of education, and his son's a moron. You know what I mean? It's all this. So what I'm thinking about, if those school teachers are still alive, I'm going to look them up on you know, 1-800-SEARCH or something. I'm going to find their names. I'm going to mail them a copy of my book, page by page, you know, say. But the point here is this. I didn't find what I was good at until I had the courage to find the environment when my genius came out. Does that make sense, you guys, here? And I ask you to do that. Intelligence is don't do as you're told. Go where you know your genius can come out. It's the largest home furnishing store in the world. It's on 72 acres. That business has resulted from an investment of $500. I went to the merchandise map in 1936 to start my furniture store with $500. By a woman who walked out of Russia in 1921, got on a peanut boat, landed in Seattle with a tag around her neck. She couldn't speak one word of English. The American Red Cross looked at the tag. It said Fort Dodge, Iowa. They got her to Fort Dodge, Iowa. She couldn't pick up the language. She was there two years. She said she felt like a dummy. Her little girl started school 
Frances would come home at night and teach her mother the words she learned in school that day. That's how this woman, Rose Blumpkin, learned the English language. She sold used clothing and other works. And 16 years after she got here, she saved $500. She got on a train, went to Chicago. She bought about $2,000 worth of uh, merchandise. All the way back to Omaha, she worried because she thought, I owe $1,500. And she only had a $500 equity. So she got to Omaha. She took the bed, the sofa, the refrigerator out of her own home to sell fast so she could get the money so she could pay on time. She took that business and built it from that start. No one would sell to her. She went into court four times because they tried to, the carpet manufacturers tried to keep her from selling at a discount. And she went into court, told the judge, I pay $3 a yard for this carpet. Brandeis sells it for $6.98. She says, I sell it for $3.98. Just tell me, judge, how much you want me to rob people. She defended herself. Papers wrote it up. The judge bought carpet from her the next day. I mean, it was, it was marvelous. <laughs> she put everybody out of business. She says, I've never owed any money since I owed those guys back in 1937. She'd never seen a balance sheet. She didn't know what accounting terms meant, but she understood the nature of the business. And she worked till she was 103. She died at 104. But the punchline is, she couldn't read or write. This woman could not read or write. If you told her this room was 68 feet by 43, she would tell you how many square yards it was like that. She never went to school a day in her life. I'm the best operator. Not I'm bragging in the country with common sense. I don't know education books, percentage. <laughs>